Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. Do you feel an invisible barrier that's blocking your prayers, your healing, your finances? My guest says you can be free. Next. Dr. Francis Miles, and uh, I am overwhelmed with the revelations you brought forth in your brand new book. It's called Dangerous Prayers. Why did you write this book? I wrote this book, Seed, because I wanted to address the cancer of unanswered prayers in the body of Christ. I think the most frustrating thing about prayer is that everybody needs it, but not everybody gets answers from it. And it can be very frustrating to tell people, simply pray. And so looking at my own journey of having to fight the, this issue of answered prayer and then finding the solutions, it was amazing for me to be able to write it because I know that there are thousands of people out there who were like me 30 years ago when I was fighting through this. And now why do you call it dangerous? I call it dangerous, Sid, because any prayer that is guaranteed to be answered is dangerous to the devil. I would say so. <laughs> um, but what would you say to those that have prayed and prayed and they almost stopped going through the motions to pray now? Uh, they've given up. What would you say to them? Because God hasn't answered their prayers. You know, yes, uh, Jesus says, addressing this issue, he, I, I, in the book of Luke 11, he talks about, you know, whosoever asks and keeps on asking, whosoever seeks and keeps on seeking, uh, whosoever knocks and keeps knocking, the door is going to be open. Jesus was literally dealing with the issue of unanswered prayer. He was showing us that any unanswered prayer is not an unwillingness on the part of God. We are just missing something. And eventually, if you keep seeking, the Holy Spirit will allow you to find something. And for some people watching this show, that something is this book, Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven That Destroy Evil Authors, because I believe that the mystery of unanswered prayer is this invisible evil authors that most people don't even know about. I, I mean, it's like there's something in the invisible world. You're saying it's working for everyone else, but it's not working for me. No. The Word of God is for everyone. So therefore, there's something separating. You felt this, I believe. And you're going to get your answers for the first time in your life. Uh, tell us about the Law of Dominion. The Law of Dominion is really, really powerful. You know, it will explain, again, the mystery of unanswered prayer and also the drama we have in the world we live in today with all the demonic stuff we are seeing today. So God did something on the deal of creation that was interesting. God said, God spoke to himself. He said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And then he says, let them, let them have dominion. Those two words, seed, are probably, in my opinion, the most consequential words to ever come out of the mouth of the Creator. Because those two words change the relationship between God and man and man and God. Let them is God literally taking himself and every celestial being out of interfering in the world of men without asking for permission. So it's almost like there's a strategic partnership between God himself, the creator of the universe, and man. And if man does not do his part, does it limit God? Yes, it limits God. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 18, 18. He said, whatever you bind, it is whatever God binds. He wants to explain. He says, he says God, God is sovereign. People say, oh, God, God is sovereign. He can do anything. Yeah, God is so sovereign. He chose to give us authority. That's how sovereign he is. Hmm. And so if we don't use it, if you don't use it, you cannot blame God because God has to honor his own, his own word. So God, knowing that he wanted to work with us, just because he gave us authority over the planet did not mean God was excusing himself from being involved. So God, in his genius, divided a legal entry point, an invisible legal entry point into the world of men. So that if you find a spirit in the world of men, look for the man who allowed that spirit, whether it's God or the devil, to come in the world of men. So you're saying that just as God realizes he needs a strategic partnership with man, 
Demons realize they need a strategic partnership with a human. Well, because the devil is a, see, the devil does something Christians don't, should do more often. He's a, the devil is good at coping God. Copying him. You know, I always tell people there's nothing wrong with being a copycat, provided you copy the right cat. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the devil knows if you copy God, you're going to succeed. So Satan saw how God was entering the world of men legally by partnering with men that wanted him to move. So Satan realized, if I can get men to also agree with me, like they're agreeing with God, I can also bring my spirits into the world of men. And so that entry point is what the Bible calls an altar. And you find it in every book of the Bible. No man has ever been used by God without an altar, and the devil has never used the man without an altar. It's an invisible entry point that connects the world of men to the world of spirit. And I believe that is the mystery of unanswered prayer. It's this invisible entry points that are in the bloodlines of people they don't even know about. But every time they want to have a breakthrough, something happens to steal the breakthrough. Now, you said that spirits need our permission. Yes. Whether it's the spirit of God or whether it's the spirit of the devil. That's right. They, they literally need our permission. Is that why you say prayer is critical because we are either giving permission to angels or unbeknownst to us giving permission to demons with our mouth. Yes, because prayer becomes our way of calling out. It's, it's how we now communicate with the realm of spirit to inform the realm of spirit of our consent for that spirit to come into our life. So that's why you find even people in the satanic world, they pray, but they just pray to their own God. Okay, this is where I'm headed, and I want you to hear <laughs> and hear very carefully. You call it in the book, God's Magnificent Plan. What is it? God's Magnificent Plan is, is when he, he showed Adam and Eve how to build this power station that would always connect him to the world of spirit. Because remember, it's very interesting how God, what God did. God gave men authority. What he did, God, he did not give men is power. So authority is in the world of men. Power is in the, is in the world of spirit. So God in his genius knew that. that if you, you have authority over the earth, but in order to heal anybody or open a blind eye, you're going to need my power. To get my power, we have to partner. Uh -huh. So that's the same in the occult. The devil says, I, you've got authority over your world. But if you need to do something supernatural, you also need my power. Because power belongs to the realm of the spirit. Authority belongs to the realm of men. And the interface that allows authority and power to come together is called an altar. That was God's magnificent plan. So it's, it's a place of the exchange. It's a place of exchange. See, in 1989, I was a sinner, but I heard the gospel. And the preacher said, come to the altar as you are, and the Lord Jesus will wash away your sin. Jesus was not in the room. I didn't even see him. I just saw the preacher. But he told me, come to this place called the altar. And I walked there. And I've never been the same. There was an exchange. My sins remained at that altar. I got his righteousness. Altars are places of exchange. Define evil altar. An evil altar is essentially a, an, an, an invisible gate where an agreement that has been made between, a, a, be, between Satan and a human being who has been either deceived or maybe consciously coming to, the, to that place because they're looking for something from the devil. That entry point, that invisible entry point, creates a demonic altar that allows the devil to do with men the same thing God would do with men if there was a revivalist who allowed God to partner with them and come and create miracles, signs, and wonders. Now the devil has an entry point. Okay, the Bible speaks about repairing the altar. Yes. Explain. Repairing the altar simply means that you give attendance to the altar of the Lord in your life. Because without an altar, God can't interfere in the world of men legally. And God is honor bound to his own word. So if you want God to move, you have to repair the platform that he needs to come into. The case in point is Elijah. Elijah knows that Israel needs God. They are worshiping Baal. You know, they have walked away from the God of Abraham. So at Mount Carmel, he challenges, he challenges the, uh, the prophets of Baal and Jezebel. And then at the end of it, he says, the God who answers by fire, without us putting any fire on this altar, the God who answers by supernatural fire, let him be God. But how does he do it? When, when the prophets of Baal have failed to bring fire on their altar, 
He now calls all of Israel, and the Bible says he repaired the altar of the Lord that Jezebel had destroyed, that belonged to the Lord. Mm -hmm. He repaired it according to the, to the number of the tribe of Israel. And as soon as he did that, the file of God uh, was released, showing us again God was waiting for the altar to be repaired before the fire could be released. Well, it's time for you to repair your altar, your entry system. The least understood and the most powerful weapon we have is about to be revealed. Be right back. We will be right back to It's Supernatural! Hello, YouTube Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. You are known for teaching on the courts of heaven, but you call the courts of heaven the highest realm of prayer. Why? I call the courts of heaven the highest realm of prayer because Jesus presented the courts of heaven as the last place of appeal for prayers that have not been answered. We find this in the book of Luke chapter 18, when Jesus is encouraging us not to lose heart and give in and throw in the tower. He says, do not, you know, do not lose heart. And then he begins to, to, he says, men ought always to pray. That's just saying, don't give up on prayer just because it's not been answered. I have a final place of appeal. In, in, we live in America. In America, we know that if a lower court hasn't done you right, there's right. still hope. There's higher court. That there's a higher court called the Supreme Court where there, there could be a remedy of a mistake made in the lower courts. Right. You know, and so Jesus is saying, listen, the heaven has a, has a Supreme Court. It's the final word. Yeah, it has a final word. And so you don't let discouragements have the final word. He said, there is a place where you can go. Then he goes into talking about a widow who needed help from an adversary. The word adversary simply means anti dikos one who's against your rights, anti against dikos rights. He said, she went to a, a judge. And, he, and she began to pester the judge for deliverance from the adversary. And the Bible says that she kept going. Then one, after, after a while, he said, you know what? I don't believe in God. I don't even care about man, but I do care about my peace of mind. And this woman's nuisance value is rising. And I want to deliver myself of this. So he gave her justice and protection from the adversary. Jesus then says, what about your heavenly father? How much more shall we avenge his own elect? So Jesus is telling us, that unless something has been dealt with in the court of heaven, you can't give up on it. That's where, where anything else you couldn't get answered in prayer is answered because the judge now gets to rule on it. Now, uh, the, when you're in court, the person coming against you or suing you, if they don't show up, the court case is dismissed. How's, the, how's this work in the heavenly court? Oh, I, you know, one time, you know, the Lord spoke to me, said, Francis, my children, you know, he, he said to me, the devil keeps getting default judgments in the court of heaven because my people don't show up for court. It's so important for us to show up in the court of heaven so we can silence the accusations of the enemy because accusations is what gives the enemy legal right to even enter the court of heaven in the first place. Just like in the, in the world of men, unless you are accused, the court system does not begin until there's an accusation. So that's why it's important for believers to show up in the court of heaven. And the most, and another thing why it's important for them to show up is because the court of heaven, unlike natural court, is biased in our favor because <laughs> Jesus already paid the price. Oh, I like that. Um, <laughs> what are some of the um, areas that we, we have the evil altars we have to deal with many people in their lives. Well, yes, yeah, some of the evil altars we address in the book on dangerous prayers is the altar of premature death, where you see in certain families the perversity of people dying early before their time. 
Life is a gift of God, and dying before your time is a murder of your purpose because it's not yet been worked out. Mm -hmm. And then we deal with pornography, that people are addicted to pornography, people are addicted to, to, to prescription drugs. We've got people that are where infirmity, cancer is always reappearing in, in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the family. You know, and so we've got, we've got rage, people that are, just can't control themselves. And you've got depression, my God, that's a big one, where people uh, go through cycles of depression. They try all different type of drugs and we've seen them get delivered when we dealt with we dealt with those issues from the point of addressing and breaking the power of the evil altar so the book is really loaded with many many areas including poverty you know poverty can be an altar in somebody's life you want to walk in prosperity but every time you try to walk in prosperity you just end up in more debt uh, you don't know where the money is going this invisible thing an, an altar of poverty could be in your bloodline that needs to be destroyed we've seen that destroyed and people begin to prosper so this book is really loaded with real life situations that people are dealing with. I can guarantee you probably for 99% of your viewers, they are gonna find one prayer that is that locates them in the spirit. And just everything is gonna change. See, the accuser in the court of heaven knows his case is weak. He, that's why he, is, he, he hopes and prays that we don't show up for court. Because once we show up, the finished work kicks in. And then, not only is that, the finished work in the court of heaven is supported by the advocate who died for us to get it in the first place. Now, what I love about the, the, the book, The Dangerous Prayers from the Court of Heaven That Destroy Evil Altars, I help people show up in the Court of Heaven with prayers that are guaranteed to work for them. Do you have something you want to appeal to the Court of Heaven? And you make it even easier for us. You, you give us the prayers, <laughs> uh, the, the ammunition, so to speak. You call the blood of Jesus the most powerful weapon in the court of heaven. Yes, because the Bible tells us in, the, in Hebrews 12 that the blood has a voice. It's a voice more powerful than the voice of the blood of Abel. Now, here's the thing. If the blood of Abel had such a voice that the God of heaven could not rest until we judged the situation, what about when the blood of his son who never sinned, who, know, who obeyed God to the end, when that blood begins to speak, both the devil and bo both God and the devil have to listen to it. That's why it is the most powerful weapon any believer has in the court of heaven. And in the way I designed the prayers, the dangerous prayers in this book, Sid, I made sure every one of them, there was an appeal to the blood. He built in all of them because it is a powerful voice in the court of heaven. It reminds God of everything Yeshua did. The cross was an altar. The cross is an altar. Because an altar is a, an altar is a, you see, altars in the old covenant, God will show them their places of death, their place of sacrifice, and Jesus sacrificed himself for us on the cross and making the cross an altar. That's why when you go to the cross, I don't matter what it is, sinners can get delivered, people can get healed, because the cross is an altar where we can exchange our unrighteousness for his righteousness, our sicknesses in for, for, his, for his healing. So whether the, uh uh, the, the evil altar occurred uh, several generations ago, or even today, Yes, it can be dealt with in the courts of heaven. It can completely be destroyed. And I've, I, I even have a biblical example in uh, 1 Kings 13, where God sends a man of God to, to bring in the judgment of the Lord, the judgment of the court of heaven to an evil altar that was attended to by the king himself in Bethel. And when, when the prophet was done with it, the altar was destroyed by God and his ashes were poured out. That's what's gonna happen, see, when people pray these dangerous prayers. Are you finding many people praying these dangerous prayers and getting set free? Oh my God, people getting supernatural miracles. You know, we were just, I was just in Alabama seed and a woman came walking on a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair. And then she came, she, you know, she looked back, she needed a miracle, so I was getting ready to pray for her to get healed. And when she gets there, she's really more concerned about her husband who was uh, at home uh, dying in stage four cancer. And uh, so I said, you know what, why don't, you, you, why don't we do a double healing? We've broken the pile of these evil altars. Why don't we do a double healing? So I prayed for her and then I released the light beams of Jesus to her husband. And I said, I see the light beams of Jesus going to your husband's right now. Said instantly she got healed and she left the, the, the wheelchair at the altar and began to walk around. 
and people are screaming and shouting, and then it gets better. She gets home at 10.30. Normally because of the stage four cancer pain that the, the husband was in, he would be asleep at 7.30. She went at 10.30, he was waiting for her. She says, what are you doing? Why are you up? He says, I got healed. I was live streaming the event. And when that preacher said the light beams are coming, light beams entered my room and see the very following day, both the, the, the wife and the husband were in church. It's healed by the power of God. You know, it, it is so amazing the number of people once they get this revelation, because, I mean, you see how God handpicked him by teaching him revelation on the courts of heaven, and then revelation on the evil altars, and then making it simple for us <laughs> with the prayers to pray in the courts of heaven. I, I, I have to tell you, though, before any of that, you must make sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You must make sure that you have your own experiential knowledge of God. I want to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to tell you, if you believe it to the best of your ability, you will be a child of God. You will live in the Spirit in this life, and when you leave your earth suit, you'll spend eternity in heaven. Repeat after me, dear God, dear God. I'm a sinner. I'm, a sinner. Mm, I'm so sorry. I believe, I believe your blood, blood washed away everything bad I ever did, and I'm clean. And I'm clean. It's, so good to be clean. it's so good to be clean. I boldly say, I boldly say you have saved me from my sins, you have saved me from my sins. And, you are my Lord. and you are my Lord, and I am hungry to walk in experiential knowledge, walk in experiential knowledge of, you. of you. Amen. Call now and get Dr. Francis Miles' brand new book and three-part audio CD teaching series, Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven that Destroy Evil Altars, and this bonus bookmark, Seven Places Jesus Shed His Blood, an exclusive offer for our rich supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9765. Do you feel like invisible barriers are keeping you from the life you want, keeping your prayers from being answered? Well, no more. This dynamic book will help you close demonic entryways, break generational chains of darkness, be set free from areas of sin and bondage, understand how to enter the courts of heaven and access Jesus as your legal advocate, appropriate the mystery of the seven drops of Jesus' blood. Dr. Miles has crafted 36 powerful interactive prayers that will destroy the altars of infirmity and sickness, sexual perversion, poverty, familiar spirits, depression, witchcraft, premature death, barrenness, fear, delay, trauma, false prophecies, failure, Freemasonry, marriage breakers, demonic spirits, including Jezebel, Leviathan, and Delilah, and so much more. You will also receive Francis Miles' three-part audio CD teaching. CD number one and number two will guide you in destroying evil altars. CD number three provides you dangerous prayers to destroy the seven evil altars connected to the blood that Jesus shed. Plus, you will get Francis Miles' bonus bookmark. We've designed a special bookmark you'll put in your Bible that has those seven points where Jesus shed His blood. Every time you take communion, you're going to be able to do that same prayer just from that bookmark. It's time to destroy the evil altars in your life. Don't miss out on getting Dr. Francis Miles' brand new book and three-part audio CD teaching series, Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven that Destroy Evil Altars, and this bonus bookmark, Seven Places Jesus Shed His Blood, an exclusive offer for our rich supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9765. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's supernatural. P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 9765 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. The greatest weapon we have is the blood of Jesus. 
And uh, Dr. Miles, you were talking to me before we went on the air about uh, a woman that lost her mind in Africa. Tell me about that. Sid, before I wrote on the seven places where Jesus shed his blood, I had the experience of experiencing the awesome power of the blood. I mean, the nation of South Africa doing a crusade when I had a, oh, a vision where I saw the Lord Jesus holding a bucket or a, a, a bucket. The bucket was full of blood and then he poured it on the head of a woman. I didn't see the face of the woman. So by the word of knowledge, I simply called it out. I say, I'm seeing the Lord Jesus. Somebody seeing Jesus standing over you and he just poured a bucket of blood. Who are you? That's all I said, Sid. At the back, a older woman and a, is, comes shouting and screaming, holding a, a girl about 25 years old. They come to the front, and I only to find out that the reason she was screaming so loud is because at the moment of the word of knowledge, the girl next to her spoke to her, and the girl had not spoken to her grandmother in 10 years since she lost her mind. Hmm. So the grandmother, I mean, she's in shock, and the girl spoke intelligently, and she says, I am the one he's talking about. I just saw, and she described Jesus like she's reading the book of Revelation, how he was dressed. And mm. said, he smiled on me and simply says, my daughter, the blood is for you. And she got, she got her mind back. So this is why it's said, I believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. So I have to tell you uh, two things. First of all, I take communion every day. Wow. Second of all, the way you taught to take communion will revolutionize the what people accomplish in the spirit beyond anything they've ever thought. So that's why I've asked him to show us the way he takes communion every day. But before he does that, and be sure you have the elements ready, before he does that, I want him to teach. Teach about the seven places. Most, most believers in Yeshua do not know that Yeshua shed his blood in seven places. Now, this is important because those seven places were, were purposefully done by the Lord because God doesn't do anything without a purpose. So at every place, he destroyed something that was destroying us. So I'm going to go through the seven places where Jesus shed his blood very quickly together with you, and then we are going to take Holy Communion, and I know the power of God is going to be released in your life. And, and by the way, these seven places are taught in detail in, in the CDs that we have uh, and also this bookmark that will list the seven so it'll be easy for you to take communion every day. And by the way, I do recommend in the days we're living, take communion every day. And yes, you can do it. The Bible calls you a priest. Therefore, you can do it in your home. Go ahead. So the first place seed where Jesus shed his blood, well, it was in the beautiful Garden of Gethsemane. And the last time I was with you in, in Israel with the supernatural, we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the first time our Lord Jesus shed his blood. The Bible says in Luke 22, verse 44, that the blood began to come through his forehead like, sweat, like sweats of drops of blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's interesting. So the, I asked the Lord, Lord, why, why there? I said, first, number one, Francis, how it began is how it's going to end. It was broken in the garden. I'm fixing it in a garden again. But he said to me also, he said, you remember in the garden, I said, because of the disobedience of man, you are going to labor for everything in your life through sweating and toiling. He said, by shedding my blood through sweats of blood, I destroyed the evil altar of toiling and sweating. He says, my people don't have to live lives where just to get bread is like fighting. Uh, it's like trying to go to the Olympics. Life should not be that difficult. It's not God's plan. And today, I believe God is going to touch you and break that evil altar of toiling and sweating because of the sweats of the drop of, of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> the second time Jesus shed, shed his blood was when he was struck on the face. I mean, people didn't know Jesus was struck really hard with feet and rolled in his face. 
and blood began to come out. And I said, Lord, why would you put yourself in such a place? And he says to me, Francis, your face is your glory. As a matter of fact, this is why my, my daughter spend a lot of money every morning trying to make sure they look good. Your <laughs> face is your glory. He says, I took the punches in my face to destroy the evil altar of slander and lies. He said, Francis, there are people whose reputations, they could be millionaires, but their reputation, uh, there's the slander that came upon the reputation is keeping them from prospering. He says, by taking it in my face, I was removing anything Satan could ever use to disfigure who you are in the kingdom. This third time, the blood of Jesus was shed. Oh my God, this was even, when I, I couldn't even imagine this, but it happened to our Lord. Because Yeshua was the rabbi, and the rabbi, it was the tradition of the rabbis to, to keep their beard. And Jesus says, I gave my face to those who pulled out my beard. That must be the most painful way to bleed, to pull out the beard. But why would our Lord put himself through such pain? It's because he's our substitute, and he was destroying an evil altar that he didn't want you and I to ever have to experience. What is that, Dr. Miles? This, you see, in the Hebraic understanding, the beard was a symbol of honor. The opposite of honor is shame. And so many of you are struggling from shame because maybe for no reason of your own, you are molested. Maybe you are raped. Maybe you are divorced. Maybe something happened to you that makes you feel like you are less than. I'm here to tell you, he allowed the beard to be pulled out. So the blood that was shed there is to break the altar of shame and low self-esteem that you are fighting right now in Jesus' name. The fourth time Jesus shed his blood when he was scourged on his back, 39 stripes. According to the historian Josephus, there were some criminals, hardened criminals, who couldn't even take three of the Roman stripes. They'll pass out. Jesus took 39. So that every disease known to man, cancer, emphysema, every disease known to man could be healed. So I prophesy by his stripes you have been healed. The fifth time Yeshua shed his blood was when the crowns of thorns were, were pressed forcefully into his cup while the Roman soldiers were laughing and mocking him. Here goes the king of the Jews. Unbeknown to them, they were fulfilling prophecy because thorns and thistles first appeared in the Bible in chapter 3 of Genesis after they sinned as a symbol of the curse of poverty. So Jesus said, thank you for the crown. And you just took poverty away from my children. Now they can prosper financially. See, they made the mockery, but he delivered us from poverty. So I, am, I believe God that as you apply the blood, as you take communion, this hold of the spirit of poverty in your life will be broken and prosperity will be your portion. The sixth time Jesus was when he's crucified. Nails, see to crucify a man, the, the hands had to be crucified and the nails. And the Lord said to me, Francis, you know why? He says, because you see the hands represents the work of your hands. He said, because my, hand were, my hands were bloodied, I paid the price for you to uh, be the owner of successful projects. You, nothing will be aborted that belongs to you. The, whatever you touch will turn into God. The feet talk about destiny. And, and so God said to me, Francis, I allow them to crucify me. So that blood was shed so you can live a very productive life and destroy the evil altars of unproductiveness and fruitfulness in life. Finally, the seventh time Jesus shed his blood is when the spear uh, pierced his side while he was lying dead on the cross after he said it was finished. This one was unique from everyone from the six because it came with blood and water. Because with this last one, he did two things. Number one, he gave birth to the church, his bride. Just like the last Adam gave birth to Eve when he was asleep, God had to put the last Adam to sleep on the cross before we could come out. And then finally, that also represents a broken heart. St. Francis, I had to heal everybody with a broken heart who's, who feels like life is not worth living because something traumatic happened, their heart is broken. The blood was shed so your heart can be mended. And I pray to God that your heart will be mended so you can begin to live again. What I believe is healing every time you take the bread and drink the wine, you are a little more healed, spirit, soul, and body. 
So therefore, look forward to every day being a little more whole, a little more Jesus than you. Would you lead us, Francis? So wherever you are, take your elements of communion. So when I take communion, I apply, I prophesy into my life. I speak about the seven places that Jesus shed his blood. And I speak those things over my life. So whenever, so that's why you need to get that bookmark because it's going to help you do that every day. But the Bible tells us on the, on the day that in which he was betrayed, he took of the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body that has been broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. Let's partake of the body of Yeshua. And when supper was ended, he took of the cup, he said, the cup of the new covenant in my blood that has been shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Let's partake of the blood that forgives us of all sin. In Jesus' name. Dr. Miles, there's a lot of peace in this studio. I feel the, I feel the glory. I've just felt the glory. A new level wave of the glory just hit us when we took the communion. I believe right now people are being healed. Prophesy all seven healings for everyone that has just taken communion. I prophesy that all the seven places where Jesus shed his blood, all the seven evil altars that were destroyed by the shedding of the blood of Jesus in seven places, uh, in your life I declare that you are delivered right now from the evil altars of toiling and sweating in Jesus' name. You are delivered right now from every infirmity in your body. I see somebody with throat cancer, you're just getting healed right now because of the blood of Jesus. I prophesy right now in Jesus' mighty name that you are being delivered from poverty in Jesus' mighty name, that, they work, that anything that's been holding back the work of your hands, blocking you, uh, uh, hindering your destiny, uh, is being broken right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. I break the altar of shame and depression over your life in Jesus' name. Receive the miracles of God right now.